thank you all so very much for joining us for this Leadership Institute Town Hall featuring Matt Staver from Liberty Council. Uh, Mr. Staver today is going to be speaking on Title VII and the Supreme Court case. Apparently it's the Bostick case that, that really impacts that and how that impacts our organizations, our churches, and our ministries. The Leadership Institute, of course, was founded in 1979, about 40 years ago, by Morton Blackwell. We've been training people to be active in politics and public policy since that time. Our mission is to increase the number of conservatives in public policy and politics, and we do that through trainings like this one. So we very much thank uh, Mr. Staver for coming out and bringing us this important information. Two other points to note, uh, Leadership Institute's a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit. Because of that, our, um, our classes are open to everybody. Our faculty uh, views do not necessarily reflect those of the Leadership Institute, and we, are, um, we, don't, we do not take a partisan position or we don't endorse or oppose uh, political candidates, pieces of legislation, or um, political parties. That's the word I was looking for that whole time. Anyway, so once again, I thank you all for joining with us. Uh, Mr. Staver here has got a very long resume. This time I will not attempt to read it all, uh, but he is the, the, um, a, a pastor, a senior pastor, the founder and, and co-founder and president or chairman of, of Liberty Council. Uh, Mr. Staver, please let us know about yourself and please share with us what you have to share today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dina, and thank you, uh, Liberty, uh, the Leadership Institute, for all you do and uh, for putting on this uh, presentation. Um, I'm Matt Staver, founder and chairman of Liberty Council, as uh, Dina said, and Liberty Council is a national ministry. We have offices in Florida, Virginia, Washington, D.C., and we're working all over the United States on religious liberty, the sanctity of human life, and marriage and family-related issues. Uh, we also have a public policy uh, branch as well, Liberty Council Action, and a number of other ministries. So we are working a lot right now, uh, in addition to all of our normal cases, with regards to a number of the cases involving churches uh, that are under significant restrictions in places of fellowship, houses of worship. But what I wanted to talk about today is the Supreme Court decision on Title VII in what is called the Bostic case. That was one of three cases, all consolidated, but they came under one opinion. So let me begin to walk through this. We'll have time for some Q&A, and I'm sure you're going to have some questions as we walk through this. The Bostic case dealt with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, the application of this law in terms of what it applies to is a federal law, and what we're going to be talking about with regards to Title VII involves employment. As it relates to its application, it applies to any employer uh, that has 15 or more employees for each working day in each of the 20 or more calendar weeks in the current or preceding calendar year. So if you fall underneath that number of employees, you're not governed by the federal law, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. However, whether you're not covered by that or whether you are covered by that, you also have to look at state and local law regarding employment because the, each state and local area typically have a parallel or similar provision to what's in Title VII, but typically each state, particularly also uh, with regards to local uh, ordinances, apply to lesser employees. So even though you're not covered by this, you may be covered by something similar, and it would uh, depend upon your different state and the locale that you're in. And if you are covered by this, you always have the other state and local issues to deal with. I'm only going to be focusing on Title VII as it relates around the country and as it applies to employers that have 15 or more employees, which is a large number of employees. Title VII, with regards to the employment provision, says that um, you cannot, uh, with regards to employment, discriminate because of a person or an individual's race, color, uh, religion, sex, or national origin. Now, this provision with regards to religion in Title VII does not apply to a religious corporation, association, 
an educational institution or a society with respect to employment of individuals of a particular religion. In other words, as it relates to churches, houses of worship, other religious employers that are part of this definition, and it's really all the religious employers that you can think of, uh, the issue of whether you can hire or fire based upon religion consistent with that employee's duties within that religious corporation does not apply. Meaning that, for example, a Catholic church, let's just use churches as an example. That's the easiest example to, to use, but it applies in other situations as well. A, a Catholic church can make hiring decisions based upon people who are consistent with the Catholic doctrine. A Protestant church can do the same thing. And you can do that within different denominations, Baptist, Assemblies of God, Pentecostals, whatever it may be, can clearly hire people consistent with that particular religious belief and mission. The same would be true for uh, Orthodox churches, uh, synagogues, and so forth. So the religion provision does not apply to these religious organizations. Uh, therefore, you can make hiring and firing decisions based upon religion without Title VII applying. Let's look at the history leading up to the Bostic decision that occurred this year, 2020. Uh, before we even get to the U.S. Supreme Court, before we get to a lot of the litigation, there have been multiple attempts, many, many attempts for decades to amend Title VII. The first attempt was to amend Title VII to add the word sexual orientation as part of the listed classes along with sex, sex comma sexual orientation. Then when that failed, it was expanded to include sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity. So those two particular words or combination of words, sexual orientation and gender identity, there have been multiple attempts for decades to pass this in Congress. Congress has never been able to get enough votes to pass it in both chambers. So a version of this amendment never uh, got to any president's desk. There currently is a version that was passed in uh, the US House that actually did this among many other things to Title VII and other federal laws. Uh, but that is stalled and there is no chance that it will pass in the Senate to get to the president's desk for signature. So all of these attempts have been uh, happening over decades to add sexual orientation and gender identity to Title VII. Every single one of them have failed to get enough votes. Up until the time where the Supreme Court made its decision in 2020, the first 10 federal courts of appeals, 10 for 10, the first 10 federal courts of appeals to actually be presented with this question, does the word sex also include sexual orientation and gender identity? They all concluded, no it doesn't, that the plain meaning of the word sex was biological male and female and sexual orientation and gender identity are not included. That means the first 30 of the 30 judges unanimously that have been presented with this particular question also affirmed the plain meaning of Title VII, that the word sex does not include sexual orientation or gender identity. In fact, the attempts by Congress to actually include that, by members of Congress, I should say, to include sexual orientation and gender identity, really underscore the fact that the members of Congress also understood that the word sex in Title VII does not include sexual orientation and gender identity. So now we come to the Supreme Court decision. It involved three employers. Uh, two employers ultimately dealt with somebody who was homosexual, somebody who was in the employment and ultimately informed the employer uh, that they were homosexual. One was a private employer, one was a government employer. In both cases, uh, the employer, when that happened, terminated the individual. Now, the amazing thing is that the Supreme Court does not go into the detail of these particular cases, which is very odd uh, for them not to go into the detail. They just lump these all in together to essentially say they were fired because they were homosexual. 
Uh, but in the one case, for example, where you have a private employer, this individual uh, ultimately was involved in a Altitude Express, which was the company, and did skydiving for the public. And people were strapped to that individual as they jumped out of the plane and they dove uh, with the skydiving expert uh, they were attached to. Before the skydive actually occurred, uh, a woman who was going to be skydiving with the male instructor was about ready to be attached to the male instructor. And the male instructor said, you don't have to worry, I'm gay. Um, that offended the individual. And after the skydive, uh, reported that complaint to the employer. As a result of that particular uh, statement to this particular employee or the employee to the uh, customer, that individual was terminated. You won't find any of that information in the Supreme Court decision, interestingly. And the next one was, the third case was regarding what uh, the court case says is a transgender. This is an individual who worked at a funeral home. Uh, you don't have much information about that either. There's very scant information, which is very unusual for the court. It was mostly philosophical and very few cases that are cited by the majority opinion. But at, at any rate, uh, in this particular case, the funeral home was owned and operated by a Christian. Uh, this person had been an employee for a few years and obviously was born and identified as a male. But one day told the employer that he was going on vacation and when he returned, he was going to be identifying as a female. The employer uh, talked to the employee and said, that's not gonna work for us because first we're a Christian employer. Uh, that goes contrary to our Christian and biblical beliefs and standards. But moreover, this could cause very uh, significant disruption at a time and in an environment where we want to be very respectful of individuals who are mourning the loss of loved ones or friends particularly those who had known this person um, as male, now hear about the fact that this person is identifying as female. As a result, that person was terminated. These three cases ultimately went to the United States Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided them as one case under the name Bostic. Now, here's the amazing thing. The court looked at the actual words of the text and they said it's very clear that the word sex in Title VII means biological male and female, just like the first 10 courts of appeal, just like the first 30 judges that ever took a look at this said it means biological male and female. The court also agreed that the drafters of Title VII going back to 1964 did not envision sexual orientation or gender identity to be covered by Title VII. Amazingly, the court does not go through much, it mentions briefly, but not through very much at all of the history of the failed attempts, the repeated decades long failed attempts to amend Title VII to include sexual orientation and gender identity. They mention it, but they refuse to even mention how often that had been done and uh, had been attempted. And frankly, that is a significant situation. You've got the first 10 courts of appeal saying it refers to biological male and female, not sexual orientation, gender identity, the first 30 judges, multiple attempts for decades to add language of sexual orientation, gender identity, all of which failed. The Supreme Court acknowledging that sex refers only to biological male and female and that the drafters never envisioned sexual orientation or gender identity. You would think at this point uh, that the case would be very easy to decide, uh, but uh, surprisingly, uh, the court went the other way. In a 6-3 decision authored by Justice Gorsuch, the court held that the termination of an employee because of sexual orientation or what they called transgender status violates Title VII because it is a termination because of the person's sex. Now, the court did not, did not explain what it meant by transgender status, nor did it explain the breadth of what could be covered by the word sexual orientation. That is an exceptionally broad term that can cover a wide variety of um, permutations 
and it did not even discuss what transgender status would be. Incredibly, uh, Justice Gorsuch never referred to the plaintiff in the Harris funeral home case, the transgender, as a male other than the fact that he was assigned, which is amazing to say that, that he was assigned at birth male and now identifies as female. Always referred to the plaintiff in the case uh, as female. Now, that was a 37-page opinion. Very few um, cases and very little history. A lot of the facts that you would normally uh, su suspect and, and expect in a case were not there. Uh, Justice Alito, joined by uh, Thomas and Kavanaugh, who also wrote a separate uh, uh, dissent as well, wrote a 107-page dissent. That's including some of his uh, appendix that he had, 107-page dissent. And then Kavanaugh's separate dissent was nearly as long as the majority opinion. So it's a very long opinion, but the dissents are exceptionally long, and Alito's is exceptionally uh, cited and footnoted. In fact, Justice Alito says that the majority opinion masquerades as a textualist decision, but it's like a pirate ship flying under the flag of textualism, meaning that it's fake, it's phony. It has nothing to do with the text, that the clear language of the statute cannot be applied to extend to sexual orientation or gender identity. Now, that's the particular background of this case. We can talk a little bit about uh, Gorsuch, and maybe we'll do that in some of the Q&A. You may have a question about the fact that he wrote this decision. Um, it is certainly shocking to many people because he has been considered a textualist. This particular decision was not textualist by any means at all. In all the other cases, he has been very textualist, uh, very consistent with the history. Uh, this is the, the very first one that I can recall uh, that ultimately literally went the other way. Uh, the question is, how could this happen? And, uh, you know, uh, that was one concern that some people had of uh, the, the justice when he was being nominated because of his uh, association with various different groups, particularly his church denomination that he was in, in his Pacific church, not the denomination as a whole, perhaps, uh, but with regards to the LGBT issues. And when you read his opinion, it is very, very much uh, pro-LGBT uh, in its language and its ultimate conclusion. So let's look at the implications for religious employers. First of all, Title VII only applies to employment. It does not apply to public accommodation. So it does not apply to uh, bathrooms, shower rooms, locker rooms, private women's facilities, and so forth. Title, uh, th there's a separate title uh, within the 1964 Civil Rights Act that deals with public accommodations that would address the issue of uh, facilities, restrooms, and so forth. But that provision does not include the word sex, does not include the word sex. So this particular case will not be applied to the other part of 1964 Civil Rights Acts as it relates to public accommodations. Doesn't mean that it's not going to have implications for other federal or state laws uh, when people look at this as an example or an argument to try to have courts do something similar with other laws. But as it relates to public accommodations, this does not apply at all because the word sex is not in that provision of the 1964 law. Title VII still allows, as I mentioned before, religious employers to hire and fire based on religion uh, relevant to that particular person's job. Other state and uh, local laws may apply. We're not going to address those because that would be too comprehensive to be able to do that. We'd have to do that on a 50-state basis and every local law as well. The Bostic uh, provides, however, some language about religious freedom protections, and that's what I want to go to right now with regards to religious freedom. The Harris funeral home case was the only case that actually had some religious freedom argument. In fact, the Harris funeral home case at the federal district court and the court of appeals had the 
Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 as a defense. And at the district court, that is the basis on which Harris Funeral Homes won the decision in the lower court. The Court of Appeals ultimately reversed that and uh, sided against Harris Funeral Homes, but they argued the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. Inexplicably, when the case ultimately was petitioned to the United States Supreme Court, the Harris Funeral Homes dropped, dropped the religious free exercise argument. And that turned out to be a fatal mistake of Harris Funeral Homes. Now, in the reply brief of Harris Funeral Homes at the Supreme Court, they still maintained in a footnote, but the argument was not there, that the owner of Harris Funeral Homes was a Christian and that this would violate his sincerely held religious beliefs to continue to have a person as a transgender in the employment. However, it also noted uh, that Harris Funeral Homes had abandoned the religious free exercise claim, which in fact it did. Uh, that turned out to be a huge mistake. The Supreme Court addressed uh, two different religious freedom options. And before doing it, they said, we don't have a religious freedom claim here because no one is pressing that cause of action, that defense. Harris Funeral Homes had it below, but dropped it before, um, you know, at the Supreme Court level, didn't present it in the petition for certiori and didn't argue it in their opening brief. So that claim is not there. But they said religious employers may question how this will apply to them, although we're not going to decide that particular issue because we don't have a case right now. They gave some general guidance. First, they said, we've been very strong in protecting uh, First Amendment free exercise rights. And the court cited to one of its previous so-called ministerial exception cases. Now, the Supreme Court also decided a case this past uh, 2020 term uh, regarding the ministerial exception. The case that it cited before, the Hosanna Tabor case, uh, dealt with an individual who was a teacher in a religious school who ultimately was terminated uh, over situations of narcolepsy, falling asleep, having a difficult time staying awake on the job. The person ultimately was terminated after a period of time. That individual uh, brought a claim uh, alleging that it was a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The employer defended on the basis that this person fell under the ministerial exception. The Supreme Court agreed with the religious employer. In this particular case, the teacher also had the option uh, through this particular religious body to eventually become classified uh, as a minister, and she did. So at the time of the litigation, she was also classified as a minister or commissioned as a minister as the particular job functions being a teacher. So she did actually have the ministerial uh, credentials, if you will, although she was not doing uh, pastoral work, but she was doing teaching in a religious school. The court ultimately sided uh, in a very strong decision, nine to zero, uh, with the religious organization. However, this year, uh, the Supreme Court had another ministerial exception case involving two Catholic school teachers at Catholic schools. And in both of these cases, these individuals were teachers at the Catholic school. Neither one of them were considered ministers. And in this particular uh, case, uh, both of them were terminated after a period of time. They both filed an EEOC complaint, and the cases ultimately went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they were decided as one case. The Supreme Court of the United States ultimately sided uh, with the religious employer, finding that the ministerial exception applied, and that the religious organization clearly was able to uh, make hiring, in this case, firing decisions based upon their religion and their religious doctrine and beliefs. These particular teachers had at the beginning of their contract or at the beginning of their employment and every year when their uh, teaching year was renewed, they had to affirm the doctrine of the Catholic Church. They also had to affirm that they would teach 
the doctrine of the Catholic Church. So the Supreme Court said that courts cannot second guess religious employers when they make those kinds of decisions. They also said that it doesn't matter whether a person has the title minister or does not have the title minister. What matters is what the employee does. In this case, the employee was uh, communicating uh, information through the teaching job duty and communicating doctrine of the Catholic Church, and that ultimately provided a ministerial exception. Therefore, courts cannot interfere. Now, we don't know how broad that particular ministerial exception will be. We do know it will not likely apply to every one of your employees, uh, depending upon the way that your employment system is made up. But it could apply to any employee who, like these teachers, is a vehicle of communication for the doctrine and the Christian or religious mission and message of the employer. So that is not just limited to uh, school teachers, but it can be much broader than that. We just don't have any cases at the Supreme Court. But what we do know is the Supreme Court seems to be very strong, uh, continuing even through this term and protecting religious freedom under the First Amendment. The second thing is the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. Now, this will actually apply to all of the employees uh, within the employment. You don't have to be categorized or thought of as a minister, or you don't have to come under the First Amendment ministerial exception that the Supreme Court has carved out to protect religious organizations. This would protect or apply to an employer with regards to every employee with respect to your employment decisions. Now, uh, this particular court referred to the RIFRA case, this is the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, referred to it as, quote, a super statute, close quote, uh, that may actually supersede the application of Title VII. So in other words, the court, without deciding it, said the federal RIFRA on a Title VII claim uh, may ultimately provide immunity to a religious employer with regards to the result that ultimately happened in the Supreme Court case itself. Therefore, without saying any more, there's no question that if the Harris Funeral Home case had continued to argue the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, as it had done in the district court and in the Court of Appeals, uh, it would likely have come out a winner in this case. And that's why I say that dropping it was a fatal mistake for Harris Funeral Homes. But that is something that we'll talk about a little bit more as we go further. Now, protecting religious employers. What do you do to protect religious employers? What we do know is that this particular ruling for anybody who is covered, there those employers that have 15 or more employees over the period of time, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, uh, that are not religious, they're going to be covered by it. So if that employer, a non-religious employer, who does not have either the ministerial exception opportunity as a defense or the uh, federal religious freedom restoration uh, act as a defense for religious freedom, has no religious freedom defense to the case. Therefore, Bostic will apply. And if you make hiring or firing decisions based upon someone's sexual orientation or gender identity, or as the Supreme Court calls it, transgender status, uh, that will be covered by the Bostic case. Now, obviously, you can make hiring and firing decisions on other reasons, such as various kinds of job uh, performance and so forth. Uh, job performance obviously needs to be adequately documented, and certainly um, a good policy would be to give various kinds of uh, verbal warnings, written warnings, so that you have a documented trail. But if your employment decision is solely or almost primarily based uh, on the basis that the person is uh, gay or lesbian falling in the sexual orientation category or transgender falling in that category, uh, then uh, that would be covered by Bostic. Now, we won't go into it here, but I will say that sexual orientation is much, much broader 
than gay or lesbian. I mean, we've seen the anacronyms of LGBTQ, uh, and those anacronyms continue to expand. If you look at what would be covered by, quote, sexual orientation, close quote, it is a long list of various kinds of uh, situations, uh, behaviors, practices, and so forth. So it does not just apply to someone who is um, gay or lesbian. It is much, much broader than that. It uh, also can apply uh, to, and it will no doubt be litigated in the context of use of pronouns, uh, whether somebody wants to be referred to as they or Z or uh, some other kind of uh, neutral pronoun that's neither uh, male nor female, or whether somebody wants to be known neither as male nor female uh, with regards to transgender issues. This is a very broad decision. Uh, and that's why when the Congress ultimately had this multiple times, there was never enough votes in both of the chambers to get this passed. The implications from a policy and an application perspective are enormous. And this is why no doubt that the courts are not the best place to make these broad policy decisions. Now, the Supreme Court, in the majority opinion, tried to uh, blow this uh, application off by saying, well, those cases are not before us yet. Well, I can tell you what, those cases will be ultimately litigated across the country, and likely some of those will eventually end up years down the road before the United States Supreme Court, including a case, by the way, involving a religious employer who raises the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, as Harris Funeral Home did originally in the lawsuit until it got to the U.S. Supreme Court. So while we can take comfort by that particular language, there is no final decision at the U.S. Supreme Court specifically applying it to a religious employer, but we'll have to take the Supreme Court at its word uh, that the RIFRA could in fact supersede the application of Title VII for a religious employer. So in terms of religious employers, when I'm speaking of religious employers, I'm referring to all the different categories of religious employers that I mentioned uh, where I quoted from Title VII earlier, which would include churches or houses of worship, educational institutions, associations, societies, and that would also include corporations. You remember Hobby Lobby, uh, is a for-profit corporation. And when the Obamacare law with regards to the requirement for employers to provide free contraception and abortion-inducing drugs and devices was applied across the board, Hobby Lobby, a commercial for-profit organization, went to the United States Supreme Court, raising as a defense the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Hobby Lobby won that case in a very uh, close decision, five to four, using the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That's a commercial operation, a for-profit business uh, that you wouldn't normally think of, perhaps, as a religious organization, as you would a church. But nevertheless, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act still applies to those kind of corporations that are run uh, in, uh, by Christians or people of faith and that have policies and practices that are consistent uh, with the uh, operation of these religious principles. So what we want to do is encourage you to do two things. First, review and update your employment policies and your job descriptions. And secondly, review and update your doctrinal and mission statements. Now, a place like a commercial operation may not have a doctrinal statement. But uh, like some of the other religious uh, commercial operations, you can have mission statements and you can also put that uh, mission throughout your job descriptions as well as your employment manuals and so forth. And make sure that you uh, review all of those particular areas of publication, uh, any kind of contracts, if you have contracts, any kind of job descriptions. So review and update employment policies and job descriptions. That would be your employment manuals that describe who you are. And I'm talking about religious employers across the board. I'm not gonna make a distinction uh, at this point between churches, 
nonprofits or other kinds of religious organizations and commercial operations. I'm going to put them all under the rubric of religious organizations uh, and religious employers that would also include educational institutions. Check out your employment uh, manuals. Make sure that your mission is very clear. If you have doctrinal statements, make sure your doctrinal statement is very clear. You can put that on your website as well in a certain location, wherever you want to put it. It doesn't have to be very uh, out there prominent, but is somewhere, in, uh, somewhere on your website where someone learns about who you are, you can put it in there. Also review every one of your job descriptions and think of each job first as the ministerial exception. Does this person categorize as a ministerial exception? Does this person, as part of his or her job, communicate the mission and the doctrine of the religious organization? If so, make sure you think through that in your job description. And certainly, even outside of those that may not fall in the ministerial exception, make sure that your job descriptions also include some language with respect uh, to your uh, religious mission and your doctrine. And you can also do that with an annual affirmance uh, of individual employers every year to affirm that. You don't have to do that, but as long as they did that once they began, and now, for example, if you change, you add that material to your information now, become more specific, you can ask people, even though they've already uh, become members of your employment, to affirm and sign off on those particular policies. You wanna obviously review and update your doctrinal and mission statements as well. At Liberty Council, we can provide you uh, samples uh, for your bylaws, if you wanna put this in your bylaws, for your doctrinal statements, to add to your doctrinal statement, uh, to put it in your policies, your written policies, and even into your job descriptions. We can provide that to you at no cost, and we can uh, give you the website to go to lc.org, it's lc.org, uh, and there's the website there, and there's the phone number for you to call for more information. You can also send an email to liberty at lc.org, liberty at lc.org, and you can ask for information on religious um, policies or religious employment policies uh, for, for you, and we can provide that to you. We'll continue to update those as time goes on. But Dina, with that overview, where we are with this particular case, I know we probably have a lot of questions. Uh, let's go ahead and open it up for Q&A. There are quite a few that came in. Um, so I'm just going to take these in order because I think they're all good, and a lot of them had to do with things that you were talking about as you went. Um, the first one is, what recourse does an individual citizen have as it pertains to activist SCOTUS judges seizing control outside of their constitutional role that infringes on our protections and freedoms? Can an ind individual file against SCOTUS to stand for the truth? No, no, unfortunately, that's uh, not the case. Uh, judges, whether they're um, Supreme Court judges or federal uh, judges at any level, they're appointed essentially for life. Now, you can impeach them. Uh, the one judge that was impeached um, a couple of decades ago out of South Florida was impeached because he took a bribe from uh, one of the litigants uh, in front of the judge uh, that he was uh, trying the case on. Uh, he was hearing the case. He took a bribe, was impeached. That's the last one that was impeached over the last um, probably 15, 20 years. Interestingly, uh, that uh, judge, once impeached, ran for the U.S. Congress and is currently sitting as a U.S. member of the House of Representatives. So that can happen. It's a very rare situation uh, for it to happen. And um, that's really the, the recourse there. Uh, it, and that's the option, but it's a very high hurdle and uh, it hasn't been used very often. Unfortunately, um, it hasn't been that effective uh, in these situations where, where you have issues uh, such as this. Uh, the, the main thing obviously is to get the right judges that will adhere to the constitution. Um, as I mentioned uh, 
Justice Gorsuch has been doing that, except in this particular case. Uh, the one issue that was raised as a concern during his confirmation was uh, on this very issue, on this very issue. So this is not a total surprise. Uh, it was sort of um, pushed to the side by those that were uh, supporting his nomination. Um, and assurances were made that despite uh, some of the things that he might have said or the um, associations uh, that he might have been in with regards to his various communities uh, that he is part of in his uh, regular life before this appointment, that he would be adhering to the text of the Constitution. And obviously, we see he did not. Okay, which uh, basically answers uh, Helena's question which was, it seems that the groups who promoted Gorsuch did not do their homework. Did they not look into his church, his and his church's religious beliefs? So I think you've just answered yeah, that. that, you want to expand? that, that uh, Dina, yeah, that was an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, attended a very um, um, pro-LGBT church. So the minister was very much pro-LGBT, quite, quite an activist in that area. And um, people were ultimately presented with information by those that were um, pressing his nomination um, that his personal views or those kinds of things would not come into decisions. Uh, frankly, on every other area that he's ever done, he's been very, very good. Um, and he is somebody who does stick to the text of the Constitution. His opinion um, pretends to stick to the text of the Constitution, but it clearly does not. Got it. Okay. Um... When I say constitution, I mean the statute. Uh, it, it clearly does not, as Justice Alito actually had uh, adequately and, and very forcefully pointed out. Okay, thank you. Um, Michelle Wright writes, but if homosexuality goes against their religious beliefs, I guess the organization or the companies, then they can't exclude employing that person based on not adhering to the religious, religious beliefs of that organization? No, if you have uh, the if you are a religious organization, uh, then the federal RIFRA, and we're talking about an EEOC claim, which is a federal Title VII claim, then you have the federal RIFRA, the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, that applies to any kind of federal law. Now, if you ultimately have a state claim that's using state law the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act does not apply. You have to look for other kinds of protections there. So we're just talking about the federal EEOC complaint, which is a Title VII complaint for employment. Federal RIFRA applies. And that's going to apply to any religious employer. It would have ultimately, um, I believe, saved the day for Harris Funeral Homes had they continued to litigate it at the U.S. Supreme Court. I think they would have been a win. You would have two losses with the non-religious employers, the ones dealing with sexual orientation, but you would have had a win for Harris Funeral Homes, the religious employer, uh, on the issue of the transgender issue. So uh, they dropped it, and so therefore they had no Religious Freedom Restoration uh, Act claim. They just went based on the actual history and the text of uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So that particular employer, Harris Funeral Home, or any other religious employer uh, under the RIFRA uh, could make those kinds of decisions as it relates to sexual orientation or transgender status. Now, again, let me just make a, a, another pause here for a moment. The Supreme Court did not definitively have a case to that effect, but what they did is gratuitously say that the federal RIFRA is a super statute and would uh, likely um, supersede the application of Title VII. The problem is we don't have an actual case with a specific set of facts to that at the U.S. Supreme Court. We would have had Harris Funeral Home continue to press the RIFRA claim, but they didn't. So for now, I think uh, we can move forward assuming RIFRA is going to apply for any Title VII case, and that's going to apply across the board. It's not the more narrow exception under the First Amendment ministerial exception. It's a broader exception, a broader application. But what do you have to do as a religious employer is you have to really make sure that your employment policies, your practices, your doctrinal statements, if you have one, your mission statement, your job descriptions, 
your employment manuals, uh, whatever it may be, uh, that those are expressing who you are as a religious employer. And that's really, I think, critical uh, right now to make sure that your particular place of employment is in the best position to use the federal RIFRA if and when you're challenged. Which is a fabulous lead into the very next question from STAR, which is how do the mission and job descriptions need to be updated? Can you give us like an example sentence that might be included in those to update? Yeah, there's not, we have more than one sentence, and so we can provide that to you in these drafts that we have, and, and we can provide them to you in Word, so you can take them any way you want to and tweak them consistent with your particular situation. But say, let's take, for example, a doctrinal statement. Let's start with that. Uh, the doctrinal statement doesn't have to, but it should say somewhere in your employment policies about uh, the issue of human sexuality. You should address that. I would also include addressing the, the matter of regarding the sanctity of human life as an example. Uh, that certainly would help in a case like we had with um, the Hobby Lobby case and the Obamacare. Uh, their objection was based on religion, particularly on the pro-life side of, the, of that uh, particular uh, argument. So you would want to make sure either in your doctrinal statement or in some other place, you kind of flesh out or have a few sentences, if you will, regarding the sanctity of human life, human sexuality. And take, for example, human sexuality. Uh, that uh, if you have it in your doctrinal statement or someplace else, uh, that God is the author of life, created uh, individuals in his image as male and female, and ultimately uh, talk about the complementary nature of the sexes of male and female. Uh, you can also talk about marriage as the union between uh, one man and one woman. So you can be very specific about that and put that in your various statements uh, in various places. It doesn't have to be in everything, uh, but make sure that you spell out some of those particular doctrinal beliefs. Also, that, um, that you, are a, you have a, a Christian mission, or let's take a Christian organization, Christian worldview, uh, you can put down your, your mission as a, uh, as a company or as a ministry in terms of uh, its uh, Christian mission and that the employees are an extension of that. So without going into specific language, we have the language that we can share with you. But that's generally the idea. We want to know when we look at your statements. That's basically what we want to ask. Can we tell from your uh, published statements, whether it's in the bylaws, uh, but preferably, you know, in your doctrinal statement, in your mission statement, in your employment manual, in your job uh, description, uh, in something that talks about who you are, perhaps even on your website. Can we make a determination just by reading that, that you are a Christian employer? And what does that Christian employment mean? How does that actually affect you as a Christian, and how does that affect you as an employer? So that's really what we're looking for. Fantastic. Um, and just there were two follow-up questions based on the answer before about mm -hmm. red rod not being used, not followed through the court. And basically, they, they both come down to say that we should continue applying RIFRA until somebody gets sued, and then that's tested at the Supreme Court level. Am I understanding that? And are they oh, understanding absolutely. that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And understand, too, that um, there is, you know, RIFRA came out in 1993, and uh, at Congress passed it. If you have to, un have to understand the political landscape, uh, back then it passed overwhelmingly in both House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans. I mean, literally, just overwhelmingly, it was signed into law by uh, President Bill Clinton. And as a result of the federal RIFRA, uh, many states passed similar state RIFRAs. I and my wife drafted the Florida Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and that was passed also in the 1990s. Overwhelming support. Recently, there have been attempts to add some language to state uh, laws to add a state RIFRA where they did not have it. And there has been huge pushback. And most of those have failed because there has been a huge lobbying effort to push back against these uh, state 
Religious Freedom Restorations Acts on the basis that they would ultimately protect religious employers as the Supreme Court said they would, at least the federal one. So there could easily be attempts in Congress, depending upon a change in political makeup, very easily uh, an attempt in Congress to repeal the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. In fact, the uh, so the, the, the bill that's called the Equality Act, H.R. Uh, 5, that came out of the U.S. House, uh, that is stalled in the Senate. That particular bill actually repeals the federal RIFRA as it relates to a defense to the application of sexual orientation and gender identity. That particular, uh, that particular bill uh, proposes the modification of Title VII to add sexual orientation and gender identity, which is what the Supreme Court essentially did through its fiat interpretation, but, as a re but it also repeals the application of RIFRA as a defense. Now, if that were ultimately to find a few more votes in the Senate, then RIFRA would be gone, and what the Supreme Court said would become a nullity as it relates to RIFRA. So um, it is a very uh, uh, important issue to watch and, and to monitor who will be uh, in the U.S. House and who is in the U.S. Senate and also on the state level as well. Because the unanimous support for RIFRAs going back to the mid-1990s has completely become very politicized and has uh, fractured in 2020. Um, Cliff, we'll go back to your comments uh, towards the end, which I think might be instructional for understanding where we might be headed. Um, Ferdis says the university offices which accommodate LGBTQ community always prefer job applicants who fall into that category. Is this the trend? Is this trend normal or discriminatory? Uh, that trend has become, well, it depends upon where you are, but there are places, there's law schools, there's uh, colleges and universities that are doing the equivalent of affirmative action, action for LGBTQ. Uh, and uh, that's primarily in public institutions, um, but uh, we've seen that happen in the last several years, uh, where there's literally an attempt to increase the LGBTQ population and provide some affirmative action or preferential admissions uh, treatment uh, in these various uh, institutions of higher education. Okay. Um. Star shared a story with a question at the end. She said, at my summer job with a federal agency, one of the best chaplains on base, so I assume it was um, DOD, uh, one of the best chaplains on base resigned because he did not want to marry same-sex couples. Has the wall changed since then? Are any, are our army Christian chaplains still required to marry everyone? No, uh, they're not. Now, under the Obama administration, it became very uh, um, problematic for uh, chaplains and other uh, men and women in the uh, armed services uh, because the chaplains and, and, and others were really being forced uh, down this road. President Trump uh, reversed that. Certainly another election could change that uh, one way or another, uh, but they have been very much in the crosshairs uh, for eight years uh, or so uh, with regards to being uh, pressured to, to do that or to resign. We know of a number of uh, long-serving uh, military men and women that ultimately uh, left the military because of that particular pressure that you described. Okay. Um, the next question that's on the topic is what personal legal protections, what, yeah, what personal protection, what personal legal protections do you suggest for employees of religious organizations? Professional insurance policy, maybe? Teachers and staff in Catholic schools are often surprised to learn that if the school is sued and they are involved, the religious education institution's coverage does not extend to the teacher or staff, leaving them in a panic and needing to find an attorney. Well, certainly I would recommend that you uh, contact your insurance agents uh, and find out what kind of policy coverage you have and for this or anything else. 
and find out the extent of, of coverage that it has. Um, and for example, in your, your situation with your teachers, you would obviously want them to be protected as well because it doesn't do you any good if you're defending and then the teacher is left there with no defense and has to hire a counsel or can't even afford to hire counsel. You don't want that particular teacher um, having an adverse side uh, argument uh, to the employer. So you'd wanna be able to help uh, protect that particular uh, teacher that you've hired to do the job um, if they're uh, sued as a teacher, not that the teacher uh, sues you, but that if the teacher is sued or you're sued because of what the teacher has done. I will go back to this other question regarding people in the military. You still yes. do have uh, various religious freedom rights in the military, and particularly with regards to chaplains. They have a unique uh, situation because they're officers without a commission, and, and their real commission really comes from the religious employer. Uh, and if that religious employer withdraws that commission, uh, then they are no longer part of the chaplain service. So they're in a very unique position. On the other hand, um, being in the military, you have First Amendment rights, uh, but they are somewhat modified. So you still have constitutional uh, rights as a chaplain or other uh, military individual. Um, and then uh, Clifton, who is joining us from um, Canada, and they are unfortunately ahead of us mm -hmm. on these issues. He has been dealing with the issue of um, being forced to identify people by their approved pronouns. And he said that when they first instituted that, many older men got really mad when asked, what's your preferred pronoun? And he says what he has to do is in order to apply and, and have the law follow the law, he puts into his cell phone the pronoun, the preferred pronouns after the names of the people with whom he's met and had contact. That way he can look them up to find out how exactly they preferred to be referred to. So I hope we don't have to come <laughs> to that here in America, but. Yeah, um, well. I think in some places, uh, you know, we're going to have to deal with that. And in some places, uh, employers are already dealing with that where, yes. uh, you know, we get we get emails. Uh, we've seen different people sign their, their names now, uh, different situations where um, the attorney on the other side will put down at the bottom of their signature the pronoun that, that they want to be uh, referred to. So, you know, you're having situations with regards to teachers in public schools uh, being told that they have to refer to certain students based upon a pronoun. And a lot of times we're only thinking about somebody who is uh, male or female wanting to identify as the opposite. But this is much broader than that. There is a long laundry list of what would uh, be classified as a sexual orientation. In fact, there is a group called Before You Act, and it's uh, focused on the educational institutions and uh, professors in school in higher education, uh, that pedophilia, or what they would call minor attracted individuals, that's the new phrase for it, pedophilia, minor attracted individuals, is a sexual orientation, just like uh, a man who is gay or a woman who's lesbian is a sexual orientation. So there's a lot of permutations to this. And that also includes how uh, you uh, ultimately would be referred to. And it's not just a, a man uh, like in the transgender situation. Uh, and whether you're transgender or not really doesn't seem to matter in this particular case regarding pronouns, whether you want to be referred to by an opposite pronoun from your, your sex. But also there's uh, pronouns, like for example, we had a situation up in Wisconsin where uh, there is a, a teacher who's male uh, he teaches in the elementary school. He ultimately did a video uh, with the principal's blessing, sent it to all K through five students for them to watch. And he did a storybook. And uh, he did it um, uh, on the concept that he was Mix, M-I-X. He told the students that he is no longer male, uh, but he's not female either, and that he's a combination of both and everything in between. And that no longer referred to him as Mr., but referred to him as 
mix, MX or MIX. So it gets very complicated and, and very convoluted. And uh, the Supreme Court doesn't even take into consideration any of the applications that uh, they just opened up Pandora's box to with this Bostic decision. Wow, and, and try explaining that to a, a, a five-year-old in kindergarten. I've got yeah. a four-year-old nephew. I can't yeah. even imagine next year having to say, okay, now mix, and we've got Mr. So-and-so, we've got Miss Espenshine, and then we've got mix, whatever, and it, yeah. oh, my head is exploding. And this, yeah. you know, I had somebody close to me declare while they were in college and of course, gender studies course that this person was now a G. And, yeah. um, and then we went from asexual and now she's back to dating men. So I'm like, okay, whatever, whatever you want. Right. And then the problem as the, as the caller from Canada says, he puts in his cell phone, uh, what the person wants to be referred to. So mm -hmm. here, you know, think of it in the context of typical, um, discrimination on the basis of sex, male and female. So if you continue to call a female Mr. or call a, a man Mrs., um, eventually that person could say, you're creating a hostile work environment. Mm -hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not a Mrs., I'm a Mr. I'm, I'm not a Mr., I'm a Ms. Um, so here you have someone who wants to be called by the pronoun they, and that is out there as well among the pronouns that you mentioned. And there's a whole laundry list of pronouns. Mm -hmm. And you got all these different pronouns now for the person in the – as the teacher in the classroom. You got 25 kids and uh, you, you could have potentially 25 different uh, preferred pronouns. And if you continually um, call someone by the wrong pronoun, it'd be like what I just described. So somebody could file some kind of complaint that uh, you're having, uh, that wouldn't be a particular case uh, there, but uh, if, if, if that's the kind of problems that public school teachers will, will have, that's not a, an employment termination case. But if you're in an employment situation and an employee that you did not terminate, you're still uh, there, but you, you, don't, you refuse to use the pronoun of their own choice, uh, or you constantly you know, don't know what that pronoun is, and the person files a sexual harassment claim saying that you are harassing them on the basis that uh, you're not using their preferred pronoun. Those cases, no doubt, are coming. And uh, those are problematic issues that uh, could easily uh, be um, fomented by the Bostic decision. Well, wow. and, and what happens when a child doesn't use Mix Smith and uses Mr. Smith? Will that child get in trouble? Will it go onto their permanent record? Could they get, could you suspend a five year old for sexually harassing the teacher? I think that we will see that very thing happen. And in fact, this particular teacher in Wisconsin. Uh, told the, the the kids, I know you've told you referred to me, but and uh, but now you need to refer to me as a mix, and basically gave them a warning um, that he wouldn't tolerate um, continued uh, misuse uh, or non-use of that. He was going to be a little bit understanding at the beginning, but you need to refer to this person as mix. So you have somebody refers to this person as Mister and continues to do it, uh, no doubt. Um, in this case, the principal is supportive, uh, actually supporting him sending this video to all K through five students without the parents' knowledge. You could run into one of these potential disciplinary problems for the student refusing to use a pronoun inconsistent with the person's sex. Mm -hmm. Well, and which points out Miss Robinson, I'm assuming it's a miss, and I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce your first name. And with a last name like Espenscheid, I try not to mispronounce people's names. Um, she says, check your child, your children's public school policies and watch the board of ed meetings because public schools in Maryland are implementing LGBTQ plus affirmative action type policies under their non-discrimination policies. And Mary uh, follows up with saying, yeah, New Jersey's done the same thing. I know it's happened here in Virginia as well. Um, yeah. um, we've only got, well, we're we're over the four o'clock end time. Um, so tell me if when you're out of time, we've got a few more questions that came in while we were having that discussion. Um, we do have somebody who wants to follow up and it's a little off topic about comprehensive sex ed and how to fight that because they're getting ready to launch an, an effort in Florida. Um, but Mary says it is unconscionable that the most influential season of children's lives they are exposed to lit literally exposed to such dialogue, absence of any input from parental dialogue, respecting that 
respecting that is a separate issue from the topic at hand, but related. Um, yeah, that, that, that's Delaware. a little separate, but it's definitely related. And, you know, when you think about uh, this issue, um, it is much broader than non-discrimination or not bullying somebody. It really goes into, there's uh, some very shocking situations with curriculum and teaching that happens in some of these schools, most of which without the parents' knowledge. And it which, is uh, very much a, a graphic sexual uh, information and indoctrination that happens. So definitely keep aware of what's happening in, in your schools, um, even though um, we've had situations where parents would never uh, consent to some of this information, uh, but a, a guest speaker comes in and really presents shocking information. And by that time, you've already rung the bell when your uh, son or daughter comes home and they're disturbed by what just happened in that school. So make sure you keep involved with what's going on in your child's life and certainly in your school. Just this morning, I gave a presentation on grassroots lobbying and told the story of how we had a mom read in legislative testimony the information they wanted to teach the fourth graders yeah. and how shockingly explicit it was to the legislators who were about the te to vote. Yes, this is allowed in the schools because they were being it was being hidden from the legislators how explicit it was, which brings exactly. up Bev's question, which is how do we effectively fight the comprehensive sex education in schools? Well, I think you do what, uh, Dina, what you just did in terms of that illustration, find out what it is and, and don't just use their stated language, go into the information that they're providing. Uh, you know, this is something that really should be between the parents and, and the child and uh, not the school. And typically what happens in the schools is it becomes very um, liberalized as it relates to sexual practices. And we're talking about even uh, in kindergarten, there's curriculum that's out there. Planned Parenthood has curriculum. Um, other organizations, GLSEN, others have curriculum that is uh, very disturbing, including telling uh, children as young as kindergarten, first grade, second grade, that uh, they don't have to decide whether they're male or female, that they can explore and experiment and then make a decision later, almost like you're pursuing a job career you don't have to decide now whether you're, whether you're going to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a carpenter. Uh, you can just do internships. You can experiment, and eventually it'll come to you what that might be. And they're being done in that same manner for children in the elementary school level as well. Um, and that's quite widespread. And the word that comes to mind is grooming. Um, yes. Because of my background in this, I understand. Um, Bev also brought up an interesting thought. She said, can pornography and obscenity laws be used against uh, sex educators? Yeah, obscenity uh, does apply and it can be used. And uh, obscenity applies in all the 50 states and territories. Uh, in most states also have specific obscenity laws. Uh, we've been working with a number of uh, states around the country to make sure that the obscenity laws are absolutely enforced. Uh, and that there's not exceptions to these where you can drive uh, trucks through and, and bring this kind of information into young impressionable children without parents' knowledge. But yes, they, they can be used. Find out what's going on in your community. And uh, that's definitely uh, one avenue that we've been working on across the country. Okay. And then the very last question for today, and I think this is a good one to close out on because it is completely off topic, but it goes back to your silent, uh, is not, silence is not an option, which is available on the LC website, and I'll show where that is available in just a moment. Um, but Andy Bond wanted to know um, if you've got any questions or comments on the Nevada case that restricts worship services, but not gambling. Oh, yeah, I do. Well, we actually <laughs> are litigating in a whole hour California worse, as well. Right? Yeah, we, we, uh, we have a case uh, in California where also uh, that uh, governor, Newsom, has banned all worship that covers about 80% of the population. That includes even in your private home, so you can have Bible studies or home fellowship with someone not living in that home. Uh, and we're litigating there now. There's places in California where even in private homes, uh, people are getting threats to turn off uh, water and um, power uh, if they 
violate those uh, kinds of orders. The one in Nevada, yeah, that, that's also an outrageous situation. That wasn't our case, but that particular case, the Nevada allows the casinos to have 50% of occupancy, and they're very massive buildings uh, in Nevada, particularly Las Vegas. And, but churches only can have 50 people. Whether you have a 5,000 seat sanctuary, doesn't matter, only 50 people. But casinos can have five, uh, 50 percent. Uh, that's a big difference. Nevada actually defended that on the basis that, well, the casinos are economic drivers, and they're important to the economy of Nevada. Uh, but they also have the same thing that's happened in every other state that we're litigating again, and that is the Nevada governor, like all the cases and we're litigating in various states, uh, supports uh, mass protests with tens and tens of thousands of people showing up. Uh, the governor defends that by saying, well, we're at a unique time in history, and that's a viewpoint that people need to hear. But obviously, uh, worship in the governor's mind was not. The case uh, was requested by the U.S. Supreme Court to intercede uh, at the appellate level. It was a very um, high bar to a uh, hurdle. Uh, because it was a request to the Supreme Court to jump into a case that was ongoing that has not received a final decision from the Court of Appeals. So it's very unusual, uh, but that was the request because of the differential treatment. The Supreme Court said five to four, denied, wasn't going to grant that motion. Uh, now, the media presents that as though the Supreme Court's made a decision. There is no decision. There is no ruling on the merits. There is no case before the Supreme Court uh, that has reached the Supreme Court that was a final decision below. All these cases are still going on. So the litigation is far from over. And I suspect that one of our cases or another one of the cases out there will make its way to the U.S. Supreme Court with a decision uh, by the end of uh, June next year. And of course, uh, we don't know which way the court will rule. They've been very strong on religious free exercise and hopefully uh, they continue to do that when they ultimately get a case that they can actually rule on the merits itself. And as of now, that has not happened. Wonderful. Um, thank you for, for sharing that information with us. I do appreciate that. So um, this is the, the Liberty Council website. You should see it on your screen right now. This is where you would go for information on what your churches should be open, how to fight comprehensive sex ed, how to, um, how to change your, uh, the wording in your, your manuals and your job descriptions to make sure that it's clear that you have doctrine and you're religious based. Um, the previous one that we did, the, the one that we did last week, Silence is Not an Option, is available at lc.org slash churches. So I'm going to type that in here so they can see that it is right here and ready to go for you. It will eventually be up on the Leadership Institute's on-demand site, which I'll show you in just a moment. But this is the easiest, fastest, bestest way to see it quickly. And I'm sure I, um, that this one will be available on your website as well. I think if not, I will make sure it gets up to my website tonight. Yes, um, will, but we'll I will put give, it up there as soon as yep. it's released. Yes, I will, um, and I will be sharing with everybody here the exact web page where you would go to get that, as well as the other resources he recommended, such as how to make sure those those doctrinal statements are in your founding documents or your your documents for employment. Um, and then uh, Leadership Institute, of course, is leadershipinstitute.org. You can see all of the different activities and trainings that are coming up on our website, and we've got everything is available online right now except for I'm going to be out in Rapid City, South Dakota in two weeks. So I'm looking forward to actually being live with people um, coming up in Rapid City. That'll be our first, second actually person-to-person um, -person training since the beginning of this. So I look forward to that. And then hopefully, Matt, we look forward to having you back again to um, help us understand maybe some of the other Supreme Court uh, rulings or maybe what's coming up in the next year in the 2020-2021 session of the Supreme Court. So I look forward to all of that. I thank you so very much once again for helping us out. Um, do you have any closing final thoughts? No, I think that covers everything. And uh, thank you, Dina. Thank you, Leadership Institute, uh, for uh, this partnership. And uh, thank you for all of those that were able to take time to view this. And 
for your friends that weren't able to, you can actually watch this again at the Leadership Institute website and at Liberty Councils at lc.org forward slash churches. There you go. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Have a great day, Matt. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.